Over the weekend, MLB Trade Rumors released their salary arbitration projections. So we are going to talk about the eight players affected by that, who's going to get picked up, who might get non-tendered. Then we'll end the show by talking about the MLB postseason. All today on Locked on Tigers. You are Locked on Tigers, your daily Detroit Tigers podcast. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of Locked On Tigers. I'm, of course, your host, Scott Bentley. Today is Monday, October 9th, 2023. Thank you so much for making Locked On Tigers your first listen. Every single day, we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, including YouTube, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team. Every day, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for $20 off of your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Alrighty, well, like I said over the weekend, MLB Trade Rumors. What a career arc MLB Trade Rumors, the website has had, by the way. Whoever the mastermind is behind the MLB Trade Rumors uh, enterprise uh, has done a fantastic job. This is a website that, when it first started many years ago, was literally just a website where like trade rumors that people had heard of would get put on, right? And just, you know, here's a forum. Anybody who's really anybody can throw an article up there, like whatever. And it has quickly evolved into a legitimate and reputable source at the major league level. Like there are, I mean, Evan Petzold of the Detroit Free Press used MLB trade rumors, projections, and, and put those out there. Um, and, and all of our beat writers did, right? It's it's a It's a nice baseline because they're right. A lot of the times, right? The website is maybe not to the exact dollar, but it ballpark is usually pretty darn accurate. The model that that website has created for a lot of these projections and, and predictions from players to salaries to trades, et cetera, is remarkable. So tip of the cap, starting off the show, a little bit of a tip of the cap to MLB trade rumors, man. What a, what a career arc that website has had. But over the weekend, uh, the website put out its projections for salary arbitration for all 30 teams. And so the Tigers have eight players who are currently eligible for arbitration this winter. Uh, arbitration won't take place. The hearings, I don't believe, take place until 2024. So uh, if anybody was to make it to arbitration, they would get uh, th that would not be finalized until I think it's January, maybe even February. It's pretty late. It's pretty close to when uh, pitchers and catchers report. But uh, regardless, we have eight people that are uh, uh, blah, 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 eight people who are salary arbitration eligible. Goodness gracious. And I, you know, th these decisions won't be made for a while. Uh, this is something that again, the hearings don't take place for a while, but even the decisions to non tender them or bring them back won't be made until after the playoffs are over. But because the dollar totals were put out there by MLB Trade Rumors, I felt that it was a timely thing that everybody's kind of already talking about. Uh, Matthew Scheidel, great human being, by the way, also great writer, uh, put out an article about uh, some players. I think he focused on three players in this group of eight uh, and who he believes might get non-tendered and might return, et cetera. So go check that article out at Motor City Bengals. But um, yeah, you know, it's. Uh, it, I think it's a really intriguing list. I think it's a really, really intriguing list. And I actually find myself agreeing with a lot of what Matthew Scheidel said. But I, I think it, all eight people on here, there's some slam dunks. There's some slam dunks the other way, I guess, close to. And then there's several dudes, maybe even half of this list, who are kind of conversations to have in the middle. I think it's important to really break down all eight of these guys and uh, and kind of where they stand in this arbitration process. And, and before we get into it, I, I promise we will. I'll stop kicking the can down the road here. But it's also important to remember that with salary arbitration, a lot of times, like I would say a majority of times, people want to avoid going to arbitration and sitting in front of an arbitrator and finding out which side, you know, it turns into a smear fest by the organization to a player. And no one wants to go through that. No one wants to be sitting there and and be, 
you know, like the Brewers talking about why Corbin Carroll doesn't deserve the money he's asking for, right? Like that's just a ridiculous notion that in principle and in practice, no one actually wants to go through to a majority of the time. Players will just settle and take, here's a one-year contract, not arbitration related, just straight up a one-year deal. And the money is in between what you're asking for and what we're asking for. And let's just call it a day. I'm pretty sure Michael Fulmer did that every single year he was arbitration eligible for the Tigers. He definitely did it the last two. So it's a common practice and it's very likely, but the non-tender candidates are still the non-tender candidates, right? Either way. And so I think that that is kind of the fascinating conversation here. So let's start by talking about the slam dunks in favor of who will stay. I think that there are three of these eight players that are absolute guaranteed. They're they're either going to get one-year contracts or they're going to go to arbitration and be on this baseball team next year. Um, There's some conversations around trades, I guess, for some of these guys. But like these are the guys who the arbitration is not going to be the reason that they're not on this baseball team next year. Um, So we'll get into that. I want to lay out all eight players first and then their projected money total in arbitration by, again, MLB trade rumors. Okay, so the eight players are Austin Meadows, who has one year of control left at four point three million is his projected total. Spencer Turnbull, 2.4 million projected total. Tyler Alexander, 2 million projected total. Trey Wingenter, 1.1 million. Tarek Skubal, 2.6 million. Casey Mize, 1.2 million. Jake Rogers, 2 million projected. And Akil Badu, $1.7 million projected. Okay, so let's start off with the three guys that I think are, are slam dunks. Absolutely will get picked up, no questions asked. We'll talk about who those guys are right after I tell y'all about our friends over at Game Time. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. Uh, you can see this, the view of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect when you arrive. All, all in prices, I always screw up that part. They have all in prices that show your total upfront. So you know you're getting a great deal without hidden fees. You can also buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Just two taps and you're all set. Uh, They are obsessed with finding ways to help you save money. Uh, They have deals on tickets right up to the start of the event, sometimes even up to an hour after it starts uh, for football, baseball, basketball, concerts, comedy, theater, and so much more. If if you need a ticket to get in, there's a good chance game time is the app for you. Uh, They have zone deals. You can pick the section uh, and the seats uh, with an average of 18% savings. Really just go down the list. If you're like me and like you want to just wake up one morning and be like, oh, spontaneous kind of impulse here. I want to go see the, the Pistons tonight or whatnot. This really is the best way to do it. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets and use Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use code Lockdown MLB for $20 off of your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem code Locked On MLB for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, everybody, welcome back here. Segment two of Locked on Tigers. I appreciate you all for tuning in, making us your first listen every single day. We'll be back tomorrow, and tomorrow will be our one year in review. What has Scott Harris done in exactly one year? Uh, That's going to be a fun episode. So uh, that'll be tomorrow's show. But for now, we're talking about salary arbitration and the players that are, well, we're talking about all eight players, but... I think it's important to talk about the slam dunks as well, just as much as we'll talk about kind of the players that are on the fence here. So the three guys of those eight that I think there's no question they will come back are Jake Rogers, Casey Mize, and Tarek Skubal. Now, I've hinted throughout the season at like the possible notion that a Tarek Skubal trade isn't 100% off the table. Uh, I I still think that it's not 100% off the table, but it's pretty significantly off the table (laughs) Uh, in terms of the principle of it. I don't think is ridiculous, but it would take a massive, massive haul. And even if he was to get moved, it would not be at the expense, if we're talking in a vacuum, of like picking up either taking him to arbitration or giving him a one-year deal. He will be on this baseball team next year. I'm rather confident in that. So Tarek Skubal, Casey Mize, Jake Rogers, three guys. I think that 100%, this, this 
the money put to them in these projections is not hindering them from being on this baseball team next year. Pretty quick conversation uh, as far as the three slam dunks go. The non-tenders is where it starts getting a little shaky. And then the guys on the fence, I think, are the real conversations. But the non-tenders, I'll start off by saying this. I don't think that there's anybody on this list that there's a 0% chance that they're back next year. Or that it's, I guess, a, a better way to word it would be an 100% chance that this person is non-tendered. I think there's at least, you know, a 2 5% chance that all of these dudes are brought back. Okay. I don't think it's zero, but I do think that there are some that there are very, very low percent chance of, and that starts with Austin Meadows and the situation's unfortunate. We obviously, I continue to wish him, you know, peace and nothing but the best throughout his battle, whatever he's been fighting over the last couple of years. But, um, from a baseball perspective, there is no way the Tigers are going to commit major league dollars, a 4.3 mil to Austin Meadows. But B, and maybe even more importantly, a major league and 40-man roster spot to him again. I I just, I don't see that as a possibility. Now, I don't think that that automatically means that Austin Meadows is just not going to be a part of the organization. I think there, it doesn't mean it's not, not that. But I I do think that there is a path to him remaining here. Uh, Evan Petzold and Mark Gorosh have had this conversation before as well where like it, it is certainly possible that he is on the restricted list which like th- there are lists you can go on that don't cost you the team money right like Erod was on that when he you know disappeared for a couple of months last year like there are th- there are ways around like he's not taking up a roster spot and he, he's not taking up money but you're still committing the contract to him at the beginning so I think that that's a little bit probably far-fetched that would take a little bit of planning um, and a point that, again, like Evan Petzl to the free brought up was like there might be a path where they non-tender him and then bring him back on a non-40-man roster minor league contract and have him like play, work his way back up, see if they can recover anything from the situation. Um, but no matter what your opinion is, I know a lot of people are just like, get him out of here, whatever. I, I, I think no matter what the avenue is and what path is taken after he is non-tendered in a vacuum, this conversation we're having today, I'm rather confident that he will get non-tendered. I I would be pretty surprised if the Tigers were just going to go, oh yeah, business as usual. We'll just try to bring this dude back for the third year. I I just, I find that hard to believe that they're going to make that will that commitment to him after two years of barely playing baseball. So um, I I would be surprised. I don't think it's a 0% chance. Or a hundred percent chance that he's non-tendered. I guess I should word it, but I, I I am very close to that. I would be rather surprised if they took him to arbitration and didn't non-tender him to some extent. Okay, now the rest of these I think is where it gets a little bit. You know, the percentage gets a little bit closer to fifty-fifty as we go on the list here. Spencer Turnbull is somebody else who I believe is getting non-tendered. Now that is not a shared thought. Uh, There are still plenty of people out there who heard what Scott Harris had to say in his press conference last week, heard him talk about uh, how he, you know, the plan right now is to have a conversation with Spencer Turnbull, then go into the winter, go through the winter, have him prepare and come into spring. I think the quote was fight and fight for a spot in this rotation. My... You know the Ron Burgundy gif where he taps the papers and he goes, he points and he goes, I don't believe you. That's how I feel about the Spencer Turnbull situation. I I refuse to believe it. Uh, Until I see it with my own eyes, I won't believe it. And I've been wrong plenty before, and I'll be wrong again. And and this might be a situation where I am, but I, I do not see an avenue to Spencer Turnbull playing Major League Baseball for the Tigers anytime soon. I, I just, this this situation this year has been such a bleep show. And uh, I mean, with the with the injuries and the IL stints and the getting optioned and then switching agents and becoming a Boris client. And then after he becomes a Boris client, he's now taken, he's no longer optioned. He's just put on the IL. But then when he gets healthy again, he's re-optioned. And then he is not effective down in AAA. He, he wasn't very good. Like, oh my goodness, just a, a roller coaster with more, way more downs than ups for Turnbull this year. And and that's unfortunate because I I was more excited maybe than anybody for Spencer Turnbull to pitch this year. I I held out hope longer than most people. I've been a 
believer of this dude since he was in double A. But I mean, goodness, man, like this season just puts took so much of the wind out of the sail of any momentum he had coming back from Tommy John last spring. I, I just I find it really hard to believe that they're just going to go, oh, yeah. like And then like they're going to go to arbitration, too, on top of all the mayhem. And like I, I think this relationship is probably spoiled a little bit. Like they're going to now they're going to go to arbitration and yell at an arbitrator about how the other person doesn't deserve the money. Like, Oh my goodness. Could you ask for any more of a sour relationship? I don't know, man. Like I, I, I really, I, I find it hard to believe. I, I think he's going to get non tendered or traded this winter. I, I just, I, I, I find it hard to believe that they're going to commit again in, in a similar, obviously it's not nearly the same situation, Turnbull's been been on on the field or at least uh, in the organization. I'm not trying to say he hasn't, but it's it, I, I I come to the same con- a similar conclusion, like a similar vein where it's like I just don't know how this organization can look itself in the mirror and commit a 40 man roster spot to Turnbull again next year after what has happened this year. That seems like a far fetched theory to me on October 8th, 9th. So we'll see what happens, but I lean toward more towards a non-tender for him. And the last one on the non-tender list, I think, is Trey Wigginter. Um, it, it wouldn't stun me. I wouldn't have my jaw on the floor if Trey Wigginter was back next season. Um, but I do expect him to get non-tendered. Uh, this is, you know, I'm, I'm glad we got to see him a little bit at the end of the year because this is a guy that in April, before the injury, was literally our closer. Like, least we forget the first two weeks of the season, like he was the ninth inning high leverage guy over Lang. And then he blew that game in, in Toronto where he had like, you know, eight wild pitches. That's an exaggeration. He had like one or two maybe. Um, but he couldn't find the strike zone. and completely imploded on the mound in, in Toronto for that one game in April. It was one of the first series of the year. And then... He got hurt a little bit after that, and then we just didn't see him until like August. So I'm glad that we got to see him. I'm glad that we got to answer some of those questions. The stuff is not bad. It's just such inconsistencies as far as command goes. And I I just, I I find it really hard to believe that they're going to commit to him as well. So Trey Wigginter is someone I expect to be on the outside looking in out of these eight players. Now that leaves two guys left. And those two guys are part of the on the fence discussion. And I think that they are pretty fascinating conversations. We'll have, oh, I get to use my new graphic today. Let's go. If you're watching on YouTube, you're going to be blown away. Watch this. Okay. We'll talk about those two players right after this. Boom. Was that not the coolest thing you've ever seen? Locked on to the moon, baby. Uh, third and final segment here, Locked On Tigers. Getting some new graphics in here. Um, the graphics department is undefeated at this uh, at this network. We uh, we stay ready. Very very cool. Um, so with these last two players, let's start with Tyler Alexander. I, I have him on the fence. I just I feel like he's not going to be the biggest priority to bring back. Um, Two million dollars for a reliever, a middle inning reliever might not be a direction this team wants to go. Uh, that's, I mean, believe it or not, that's going to be one of the highest salaries on the team as it stands currently next year. Um, they have a lot of dudes that are that are still like pre-arb, a lot of dudes that are pre-arb. They have these eight guys. I just listed their projected totals. Tyler Alexander's is the one, two, three, fourth highest of those names of those eight names. And then you have like, obviously Javi will be back. Erod maybe. And then we, we have like free agency and whatnot, but like with the players that we have coming off the books, like very quickly that that's uh that that's weirdly one of the higher salaries on the team at the present moment. So I don't know if they're going to commit two mil to a, and like, that's not a lot. I, I, I also think on the flip side to talk about it in a positive light, I think this front office and this coaching staff loves Tyler Alexander. I think that he is exactly what they want. He is a multi-inning lefty reliever that doesn't walk people. That is like to a T. I'm not sure you could build a better Hinch Harris prototype. 
And I know that he doesn't strike people out. He doesn't have swing and miss stuff. And he's going to get rocked sometimes because he doesn't get have swing and miss stuff. And he doesn't strike people out. Except for one glorious day in 2019 when he set the AL record for consecutive strikeouts. Besides that, he doesn't strike people out. Um, but I, I, lefty, multi-inning, like has the versatility, can even spot start if you want. I, I think this organization loves Tyler Alexander. And, and I, I think that they are more than willing in the same breath that I just said, like I think they are more than willing to commit just $2 million to maintain him. Now the injury throws a little bit of a wrench in that as well. These are all the factors as to why I find him on the fence to me. Like I, I, I'm not super confident either way. I feel like I've said that about Tyler Alexander the last four off seasons and he always finds his way back. So maybe that's a sign that he will come back. They still have two years of control on him. I believe he only has four years of service. So uh, th this is something that if they do commit to him next year, you open the door to him coming back the year after as well. Um, but I, I do kind of stand uh, on the fence here. I uh, I would lean yes. I would lean toward he is coming back. But if they decide to non-tender him, it would not be, would not be the most shocking thing in the world to me. The last player on here is Akil Badu. 1.7 mil. So out of principle, I think that he will be back. Now, with that conversation comes a lot of of subsequent and, and like a lot of tree branches sprout from from this conversation, right? So, I think he will be back because it is 4 years of control for Badu, less than 2 million dollars. He has a ton of tools, he's shown flashes over the last couple of seasons of what he can be. I I, I do expect them to pick it up. But I also, the path for Badu to stay in this organization long term is becoming more and more bleak. This is an organization with several outfielders that everyone is more confident in long term. And at that, this is an organization with a ton of lefty outfielders at that. So, like... When you look at the starting lineup next year, he's not starting in center. Riley Green's going to be healthy. Parker Meadows is going to be healthy. Kerry Carpenter's going to be in the conversation. Justin Henry Malloy is going to play corner outfield when he gets to the majors. He's uh, a righty, but like that's still an outfielder, presumably, unless you're just going to call JHM up and he's just going to be a 100% DH as a rookie, which I think would drive Scott Harris absolutely mad. I don't think he wants... I don't think that he views that as a as peak value to call up a rookie to just be a pure DH. I think they – and, like, that's a conversation down the road. I, I think when we talk about free agency, some people are like, oh, we should sign J.D. Martinez or, like, we should sign, like, so-and-so to, like, be our pure DH. I don't think this organization wants a pure DH. I think they want to play matchups, and I don't think that they just finally got somebody who has only played DH for the last, like, four years off – their like what is the word I'm thinking of off their checkbooks sure I can't think of the term I'm actually thinking of but off their roster and I think they want the versatility to 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 and the flexibility to be able to play a lot of different people at DH and not just have one person that's so bad defensively they have to be the DH for this team anymore um and so that all leads back to Akil Badu and his future with this team not that he's that bad defensively at a pretty fine defensive year this year. Um, but just when talking about where he plugs in long term, where? Where can you confidently? Not like, oh, maybe, or oh, if he works out, or oh, if he takes steps in this direction. Where can you confidently say Akil Badu places in this lineup or really just organization period long term? Matt Veerling, another outfielder, right? Like, wh where is it? So I, I don't think he's going to get non-tendered because that's just 1.7 mil for the the tools and the potential and the ceiling that he still has. I think would be it would be a mistake to just let him walk for nothing. But I do think that the possibility of Badu not being on this team next year is fairly decent. I'll put it that way. And whether that is a non-tender or a, a one-year contract and then a trade, then so be it. But that's kind of why I put him in the on-the-fence category. 
I hope I articulated that well. Fully expect him to still get either a one-year deal or I don't expect him to get non-tendered. But I do have serious questions about how long we're going to keep him on the roster with everything we currently have on the roster already. And that's terrifying because I do think that if he gets into the right hands and the right organization, somebody is going to make him a legitimate solid major leaguer. And I hope that it's us. I, I hope that, that like, obviously that's best case scenario is we keep him. He takes steps in the right direction. He takes a step forward and, uh, and, and like problem solved, but there's still a lot of, of his game that still needs to go in the right direction for you to like be confident in like, Oh, this is the left fielder of the future. Or, Oh, this is the right fielder of the future. Or even, Oh, this is the fourth outfielder of the future. And there's just a lot of players that have similar, uh, that are also either lefties or play in the outfield or, or just have similar profiles, et cetera, that are already here. So I think that that's a fascinating conversation. I'm, I'm not sold either way, but I, I do think that it's Akil Badu is a like circle that as one of the more fascinating conversations in regards to what this team is going to do this winter and the entire organization, to be honest. And that's it. We'll end just really quickly with some playoff talk. Uh, the playoffs have been awesome. The wild card round, you know, is it, do we like the new wild card round format? We didn't have a single game three this year. We had one last year and then one in 2020. Is that if we only had two, two or three? It's a very small number. We have not had very many game threes. I'm not sure of a better alternative necessarily, but I do want to see more game threes and less two game sweeps. A two game sweep is so lame. That's like the lamest playoff series ever. You know, two game sweep. That's just that. Yeah, that's disgusting. That's so lame. So we'll see. We'll see. I, it's still early on in uh, in the returns for this. Right. This is uh, only what the second year that we fully switched to this. Obviously, 2020, but like that 2020 doesn't count for anything. Um, this is only the second full year. So early returns. But like it, it is it does make you raise an eyebrow and go hmm, like. Wonder how much we really like this. So that's something I, I kind of have an eye on. Um, I mean, the Rays, horrible baseball. They'll be back. and But like, I think it's time that we as a society give the Rays as much heat as we give like the Dodgers and other teams for choking in the playoffs. Because the Rays win 95 plus every year and never do anything in the postseason. Again, I just said 20, 20 doesn't mean anything to me. I don't really count anything that happened that year as like, super super like i don't know real is that too dramatic <laughs> um 2020 was a mirage to me um but like I, I i just i don't know like i i they'll be back and they'll win 97 and they'll be in the playoffs next year and then they'll have you know three Cy young winners out of nowhere as well candidates i should say out of nowhere next year like they'll, they'll be back they have their system in place but golly Maybe not a maybe maybe not a model that's built for uh, for postseason success. The Rangers continue just clutch hitting. That's a crazy series. That's a really crazy series. Are they up two games to none already? Jeez. Good for them. Uh, the Dodgers and Diamondbacks. Kershaw, man, Kershaw, killing me. Absolutely killing me. Um. You know, I, I think it's the Diamondbacks are so fun. What a fun, young, up and coming team. They're awesome to watch. Uh, they have some front end pitching to like match at least two front end starters to like match most teams. It's just going to be deeper on in the series. But stealing one on the road is so important. So important. Big for them. Huge for Philly as well. That that, you know, it might just be Red October. It might just be Red October, man. That what an atmosphere that in Atlanta and Philly, like that, that is going to be such an unbelievably awesome series. Oh my goodness! I mean, it already game one was already wild. The Braves getting shut out. I don't think anyone really saw that coming. It's one of the best offenses ever in the regular season. Gets shut out game one of the post postseason. We saw an intentional balk that was awesome. Baseball is the best. Oh, the Bryson Stott video. Oh, that's just, it's the greatest game ever created, man. 
makes me happy. makes me smile. We'll see what happens, though. I, I think uh, I think the Dodgers obviously are going to make that a little bit more competitive a series than it looked like in game one. Phillies, Braves, could I hope it goes all five just for the drama because it would be awesome. Uh, but the Braves are an absolute juggernaut offensively. We'll see if that maintains. Uh, the O's, you know, I, I give them credit. They fought in game two. Like, they they could have rolled over and just died, and, and they still tried to crawl back and make that a ball game. So credit where credit's due. But the Rangers... Giving me Team of Destiny vibes, you know? Just an unbelievable mark of uh, of clutch hitting and, like, average with risp this season. Remarkable. They've, they've been beyond clutch all year. Their pitching is a huge question mark, so we'll see what happens there. What's the other AL series? Why am I forgetting one? Oh, Houston, Minnesota. Yeah, like, I mean, I'm a Tigers fan. I'm a Twins hater. Uh, I, I was rooting for the Blue Jays. I wanted that streak to last as long as I lived. Um, but, like, good, objectively, like, good for Minnesota. Glad to see the fans turn out. That was a really cool moment. No no, no disrespect intended. Just, like, I I, I can't in good faith root for your organization. I'm sorry. Um, I, I was alive for 09. That, like, <laughs> I'm never going to be a huge fan of y'all. But, um, you know, it, it was cool to see the fans turn out. And like I'm certainly not gonna you know pound my fists on the table and root for the Astros anytime soon. So um, that that'll be a, a f- I mean, game one. I don't know Minnesota or game two rather. Minnesota, you know, it, it's just it's so funny. Every year there's one team that everybody goes like, oh, like they were you know so not good in the regular season, or they were so much worse than all the other playoff teams. They're gonna get rinsed, and like that was Minnesota this year. And when will people learn that like playoff baseball is different? And it's a tiny sample size where anything can happen. The, <laughs> there is no, oh, this team's going to get rolled over. That doesn't exist in baseball postseason, which is why it is the best. Can't wait, though. I, I find it hard to believe the Braves aren't going to bounce back. I still lean towards they're going to make the World Series, which is super lame and like not hot take and safe. But like that offense is so good. I'd imagine they wake up. The AL... Might just be the Texas Rangers. I think I'd still lean Astros Braves, which is super, super boring. But like, we'll see. They play the games for a reason, baby. Uh, Appreciate y'all. Tomorrow's episode will be one year of Scott Harris. Talk about the early returns on him. Give a full rundown of his first year at the helm of this organization. Talk about the future, et cetera. Yeah, we'll be back tomorrow. Peace and love. Going to Therapy's Dope. I'll catch y'all then, baby. Go Tigers.